Amen. I know you just took your seats a moment ago, but could I ask you to stand one more time and let's give our very best welcome to Pastor Mike and Renee as they come to minister this evening. Wow, please be seated. It is awesome. We came by yesterday. Well, before we get to yesterday, I just want to tell you, worshipers, worshipers, you're awesome. You, you just killed it tonight. And uh, we could have just hung out there for a while and just see what God starts speaking prophetically. But uh, I know that, uh, you know, as we drove around yesterday and, and walked around, and I just, first of all, uh, Pastor Glenn, if you're watching this, we miss you. You better not be watching, but enjoying a little R&R. &R. But we just love... Uh, we just love that precious family, and they're, they're so rich. We go back about 15 years, and then we connect with so many of you. And, and uh, I'll tell you, I think we gained about 10 pounds just since yesterday you know, because of the Batistas, you know, uh, Manjati, you know. I mean, we, you know, in Florida, it's all fake Italian, unless my wife makes it, okay? You know, I mean, we got like, uh, when the Lord sent us there in 81, we thought we'd just be there for a couple of years. You know, we're from Jersey, and uh, Renee, grew, Renee grew up near the George Washington Bridge, and, and uh, you know, they said, try grits. And I said, okay, give me one grit, and they all laughed at me. And then, and then I said, you know, uh, they start saying things like, are you Italian? I knew we were in trouble. I said, no, we're American. I'm a veteran. I, you know, okay, give me a break, but yeah, I like real Italian. You know, we don't have the water you have. The bread's lousy, but... But seriously, uh, lo and behold, 35 years later, 25 years at this post, um, God, you know, whoever he plants you, you just uh, have to be obedient. But um, my wife has been, outside of Jesus, my, my best friend and my closest ministry partner. Yeah, she, she's my, um, my sweetheart. And, and, and we are so dependent on good friends. You know, anybody who's not... In a corporate world, which we came out of, if you're not networking, you're not working in this day and age. And if you're not uh, discerning and unifying the body of Christ, you're in trouble. Amen. You're in trouble. And uh, that's why we cherish relationships. We believe we have similar DNAs at these church, you know, this church here, our church in, in Florida. We're um, just in between Disney and Daytona, a nice little place. You come down for a vacation, you better look us up. But um, I'm just grateful for Pastor Nick and, and all the staff and, and elders. But I want my wife just to just open up in prayer. And if you could stand again, okay, and just put your hands in a situation to receive. And uh, we, we just want you to be blessed. And, and we want you to, the Lord to position you to a new level. Walking through that yesterday and, and, and just praying in the spirit, um, there's a new level that you're going to have to walk into. Okay, what got you here won't bring you there. Outside of the, the word of God, which never returns void, the name of Jesus, which is your legal power of attorney, and the presence of the Holy Spirit. Okay, and I'll just share a little bit of that in a little while. And then when the Holy Spirit says now, okay, we will default to that now. Okay, honey. Oh, family, I love you. And I, I do feel like your family. I feel like we are very connected. In fact, even when we get old and retire, which is a long way from now, I just feel like this could be our second home because we love Pastor Glenn and Denise and we love you. And so I, I saw what your banner says. I saw what you're decreeing over the land that hope lives here. And so let's decree that together. We decree and say just what the banner says, Lord, that hope lives here and it lives in our heart. Certainly, we have opened up our hearts and our lives and our spirits to you tonight to have full access and have your way completely in anything that is done and said. We are here for you, Lord. We are the ones that love you and you love us. So have at it tonight. We give you our hearts. We give you our ears, our eyes, our mouths, anything. Holy Spirit spirit preeminence today and anything and everything that you want to do we just have great expectation of you building us up tonight and we pray this in the name of our precious lord and savior jesus christ amen amen you may be seated hallelujah time is at a an incredible exponential movement forward and what took 20 years to, um, for us to, to, to lay hold of a, a thought or a process or something in, tech, in a technological field is now um, 
they say three months. What was the generation, both biblically and historically, anywhere from 40 to 100 years? Now is probably something more like 10 years. 10 years ago, about 10 years ago, I'm, I'm not certain. You've got to give me a little grace uh, because uh, just time goes by fast, and this is not where I live, though this would be nice to escape our heat, okay? We pray for hurricanes so we could break the heat in September. Isn't that crazy? Okay, but I remember around a decade ago, uh, Pastor Glenn was so excited. He, he was showing us this expansion of this big bubble, this white bubble. And it was so, he was so excited. And we were excited because we, we just uh, um, started to dedicate, we dedicated our 24 acres on the Beltway, our third campus. And, uh, uh, and we had set up this, looked like a Feast of Tabernacles tent. And we were doing that around the same time. So there's so many facsimiles. But I noticed one thing that, that, that 10 years that has gone by since I was here last. My wife was here sooner because she was up here for some, one of the incredible woman venues you had. Is that there's a lot of new faces. And that's great. I'm excited about it. I love uh, looking at your material and talking to some of the staff about the different, different campuses you have, the age groups, what's happening outside. And in that 10-year dynamic, it's almost like it's a generation in itself. I want to speak to you corporately as a body, and I want to speak to you individually because you're going to have to ask a question, answer a question one day that, that we're all going to have to ask. Have we fulfilled God's purposes in our life? Now, my, though I want to reconcile two women in the, in the Gospels that had a, a little challenge with each other, but I also want to deal, that's Mary and Martha, and we're going to look at that portion of Scripture to see if, if this is a Mary church or a Martha church, okay? And uh, what it's going to take when we prepare for, there you go, that's the answer. That's part of it. It's one more piece. But, but also, you individually, because uh, individually when you leave this place, you're the church. You know, Satan really won something probably about a third or fourth century in Christendom when he said, okay, I'll give you one day a week. And then you go to church one day a week. And I think that was, it made him happy. But in reality, every day, you, when you leave this place, you're the church leaving this building. And unless we make that shift, we're going to stand before God and have to give an account for our, our new campus that we built during the crash, okay, and this new campus that you're building before God. Okay, here it is if you're taking some notes. Acts chapter 10, on, or excuse me, verse, uh, chapter 13. I want you to, to position yourself in where you are in regards to this challenge. It says about David, Acts 13, 36. For David, after he served the purpose of God, in his own generation, he fell asleep and laid with his fathers and saw corruption. So those of you that are in this building tonight that are 55 years age and older, don't stand up, okay? I don't want any of you to have to lie, all right? Uh, uh, 55 and older, I, I just want to ask you this question. Are you serving your purposes or God's purposes? Are you serving the purpose of God in your generation? In your generation? We have a big problem in Florida. A lot of, a lot of people north of the Mason-Dixon line come to Florida to get away from you know? yeah. Christmas time. We actually put out a snow shovel that we brought from up north in front of the house. People go nuts. The southerners don't know what it is. The northerners laugh. And, uh, but from 55 on up, they come down, especially if you're up north. You know, you get a, you work until down up, up north, 55 years old, you have a pension. It's amazing. In Florida, our people work until they're 65, 70, and they don't have anything called a pension. Very, very rare. Local people. Two, three part-time jobs to make ends meet. You know, uh, it's all about the beaches. It's about jobs that are service-oriented, hotel, you know, Disney, stuff like that. So we have people come down, and they come down. They have the least amount of debt, the greatest potential, the most free time, and this is what they do when they come. Feed me, feed me, 
feed me. Like you still need somebody to spoon feed you. You've been a student of the word for 30, 40, 50 years. The greatest time to store up treasures in heaven. But geographic lines fade away with this question. In your generation, like David, have you fulfilled God's purposes? God's purposes, not yours. For your generation, don't worry about the others. Now let's take a step back. Those of you that are between the ages of 35 and 55, can it be said of you, have you fulfilled to date and will you fulfill God's purpose for your generation? One generation says it's, an, it's the next generation's term. I, have a, I, have a, I deserve the rest. Play golf, play in the Florida sun, so I get a skin cancer. A lot of people come down with that, right? Uh, the next generation says, oh, come on, I got to make it, man. This is my lot to make it. I'm in a hedge fund. I'm an engineer. I'm this. I have to do this now. Okay. You know, we're going to be alive a trillion years from now. Isn't that amazing? You know, the police department where I serve calls me chaplain death because I deliver death notifications. We have a lot of suicides. People come down from up north. You know, they think moving to sunshine weather and vacation will make them happy. They come down here and they find themselves, okay? And bored. You know, you live here for a few years from Florida and you stop going to the beach until family comes down or some of you friends come visit us. Okay, let's t go to another group of people. Maybe some are outside, maybe some are teaching, working in a nursery, or just having a good time, getting good instruction from the youth pastor. Those that are under that age. Now let's look at the age of David. Before David took out Goliath, he fulfilled his purpose as a kid. He took out the bear and the lion. He was anointed king as a child. Paul told Timothy, and you know, those that are young here, Paul told you not to forsake your youth. Now let's go back up the scale a few years for David's life. He started fulfilling God's purposes. And then he put his guard down. And he was guilty of conspiracy, adultery, and murder. Then he suffered incredible loss. Yet God basically said, if you touch David, I'm going to take you out. Touch not my anointing, do my prophets no harm. And isn't it amazing? Post resurrection theology, Pentecost has already happened. The church is already called the word Christian for the first time at Antioch. The church is becoming Gentile, it was 100% Jewish. And then this is the history because David responded to a law in his life through repentance to get back on track. To store up treasures in heaven, if you would. To go about the Father's business. To recover from his slackness. And it says about him, no, nothing about his adultery. Nothing. Nothing about his failure. Nothing about what he did to Uriah. Nothing that he embarrassed the name of Jehovah. Nothing that he embarrassed his military leaders. Nothing that he embarrassed his nation, his family, and even cost his firstborn. And it said of him, for David, after he served the purpose of God in his generation, was able to sleep. You know, we, we were concerned that we would not be able to be with you. Because my wife's precious sister, Lisa, who lives uh, in the um, Baltimore area, uh, has lost her battle with cancer at 62 years old. So we just... We just did her funeral. We were just up in this area, up in Baltimore, about two weeks ago. We didn't know if that was going to happen here. I didn't know. We, I was an inch away from calling Pastor Glenn. I said, I don't, I don't, I don't know what's going to happen. And my wife says, but don't. Then we, she got a call. Our niece and nephew, our niece called, crying. Mom peacefully went tonight, a couple Thursdays ago. 
You know, the scripture says that we're all going to stand and give an account before the Lord. Now, thank God, those of us, our names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life. We won't have to go at the white throne judgment. We don't have to worry about hearing, depart from me. I never knew you. But, you know, after learning a lot from one judge and four attorneys in our church about our day in court, we will all stand before the, the bema seat of Christ and give an account for our life. This is one life we have to live. This is not a time. God has put before you a guarantee of a future with that footprint out there. You have to discern your purpose as a as corporate body and as individuals, because sometimes we hide behind the group and go for the ride. It's like 15 miles from our Speedway campus is the, is the Daytona 500, and you watch those cars. It's possible for a car that's slower than the the, the car in front of him to catch a draft behind that car and right before the, the checkered flag swing out in his wake and pass. We can't do that. We cannot slack off at such a time as this. We will get our rest one day. We will get our rewards one day. But, but American Christians are stopping at premature finish lines. And by the love of God, seeing that building and seeing the generational shifts that I've enjoyed seeing, the youth, the young couples, the, the individuals, what I've seen right now is a guarantee that God is not finished yet. He is going to do something here that I hope that I get an excuse on vacation to come up here periodically just to see what God's doing. That's an evidence. You're an evidence that God is not finished with your generation for this area. Now, as each one of you individually fulfill God's purposes for your generation, it's going to empower the pastors to reach and pastor a post-modernist generation. I never thought I'd ever say that. I almost felt like it was a defeat when I, 13 years ago, our oldest daughter, she's an apologist. She's one of the few female apologists, and she's one of the few Assembly of God. She's Assembly of God credentialed, and she met her husband in, in, in uh, Oxford University. She finished her undergraduate there at 19, and she started her graduate work, her Oxford School of Apologetics, and then Rabbi Zacharias hired her. She travels around the world, and when she's in home, her and her husband uh, handle one of our services at our church. And she told me this, Daddy, this is when she, she went some 13 years ago. She said, Daddy, I hear these fathers of Christian in here say the same things you're saying. I go, what? But he told me how the United Kingdom sent more missionaries around the world than any other nation. Daddy, they told me how they planted more churches and had more Bible societies and tracts than any other nation. And now, Lord, Daddy, the rise of the isms of the world and the atheism and the intellectualism has opened a door that the vacuum is being filled by all kind of junk. And you have a habit of saying the same thing about America. We send the most missionaries. We send out the most scriptures. We have the greatest uh, spirit-filled evangelical, publishing places. We send more people around the world. And she says, Daddy, I said, Michelle, listen, maybe 20, 30 years from now, if we don't have revival, maybe that will happen. She says, Daddy, no. And little did I know within 10 years what we're experiencing in this nation. Has us concerned. And and we have to stop running to premature finish lines. 1 Corinthians 5.24, Christ Jesus is the power of God. Christ Jesus is the wisdom of God. I shared that 10 years ago. It's not the message. But I want to look at what it's going to take to have that place not only filled, but what it's going to take for that to have significance in the kingdom of God. Because intercession is going to, it may not look the same, it's going to have to get to another level. A spirit of unity is going to have to reach to a new level. Because God only commands blessing, listen, he only commands blessing on unity. He commands blessing when brethren dwell together in unity. I, I was sharing in a car earlier, I said, you know, God could care less about who's right. More marriages fail, 
More nations are at war. More, more families split. More churches split because of every man seems to be right in his own eyes. The scripture speaks about that twice. God could care less about you our rightness. He'll only defend his son's righteousness. So we have to be unified like never before. We have to see needs and meet them instead of relegating them to somebody at the church office. We have to empower a team of people with the pastor and the team to start reaching the city. Because, you know, when I, I, I'm asked, and I tell, I said, don't ask me to do church growth stuff, please. I said, I'm going to mess you up because they say, Okay, give us the, the numbers. And I said, well, we're in a small town, about 25,000 people in our church. There's probably about 900 people, that, adults that call themselves members of the church. I wish they were all there on one Sunday. You might have a heart attack and go to heaven. I don't know. And I said, but I, I pastor a flock and a fold. The fold are the people who are members of the church. But the flock are 23,650 people, the, the population of my city. I just have a lot of lost sheep. I was, going to, I was going to build a message, but I think it would have affected my friendship with Pastor Glenn that if you build it, who says they'll come? <laughs> but that's not the case here. They're going to come. Now let's look at the little story of these two women that always seem to have a conflict and are used as illustrations. And they, get a, they both get a bum rap, okay? Luke chapter 10, verse 38 through 42. I want to deal with the conflict between the Mary church and the Martha church. The Mary believer and the, the Martha believer. And somewhere find a balance of the Jesus believer. Now as they went on their way, Jesus entered a village and a woman named Martha welcomed him into her house. And she had a sister, Mary, who sat at the Lord's feet and listened to his teaching. But Martha was distracted with much serving. And she went up to him and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Tell her then to help me. (laughs) But the Lord answered her, Martha, Martha, you're anxious and you're troubled about many things. He didn't attack her character or her giftings. We have to understand that. He was trying to just draw something here. But one thing is necessary. Necessary for that culture, for that generation, for that time, folks. And for the times of the presence of God and the times of awakening and the times of evangelism and the times of city reaching. Mary has chosen the good portion, which will not be taken away from her. I remember years ago when the Purpose Driven uh, Church book came out and and had a lot of good things about it, and it took a lot of hits, too. So you could look at Martha as being the Purpose Driven, uh, the uh, Presence Driven, uh, Purpose Driven person, and then Mary being the Presence Driven person. Now, we, in order to see God's plans to be manifested that will shake this region in that building over there and this campus, We're going to understand we do need to have purpose. Remember how we started tonight. David fulfilled God's purposes for his generation. We need to have a purpose. What's your purpose, sir, ma'am? What's your purpose? What's your purpose? Is it God's purpose or your purpose? It was a trick comment. And will it affect your generation, your area of authority and your area of influence? And let me tell you, seek Godly influence, because authority will come. If you seek authority, you'll always get burnt and burn somebody. Seek godly influence, and proper authority will come. The purpose-driven church, if not careful, becomes a consumer-based church, or the Martha church. And then it'll raise up people that are always a consumer-based believer. They're going to visit this church until the next best thing is built. The next best guest person's there. The next best band is going to have the latest technology. It's going to be consumer-based. And in a postmodernist society, we're experiencing this now. We're experiencing a consumer-based mentality in, in, in believers that are shopping for churches. The biggest transfer of growth we've ever had is transfer of growth in America in the last 40 years. Should not be. 
But yet we need to have our purpose. What's your purpose? What, what is the DNA for this church corporately, collectively, and what is it for you? What is it for the worship ministry? What is it for the prayer ministry? What is it for discipleship? What is it for allowing the Holy Spirit to impart people with the Holy Spirit and the gifts of the Spirit? That's one of the, the byproducts I believe God wants to do. Paul said, I desire to come unto you that I might impart some spiritual gift. That's scripture. You see that in the, in the opening of Romans. That's a good thing. Don't be afraid of it. So we have to have our purpose, but we have to discern the times when we need to be presence-based. And this is what happened up here tonight. The presence of God. Thank you. We need to marriage the purpose and the presence of God. We have to have a reconciliation of Mary and Martha. We cannot do without either one. We have to reconcile the Mary and Martha. We have to reconcile to having a purpose. Those who know their God shall be strong and do exploits, Daniel said. Then, then Jesus said, you shall receive power after the Holy Spirit comes upon you. We see the church by the third chapter finding its purpose. Okay, we're going to go to the synagogue. And all of a sudden, the light comes on. The presence of God. We're seeing this guy here. He's always begging. He's crippled. Silver or gold, I don't have that which I have. I give to you. In the name of Jesus, arise up and be, be, be healed. And then within several chapters, that group of people, that movement was started in the fire of God, the presence of God. They found their purpose. And they start transforming Israel on the lee side of the Mediterranean. And this what they were accused of. These people have turned the world upside down. There's not, millennials, you'll, you'll have to say amen. There's not too much that will impress you anymore. Buildings or strutting preachers. They're so much steeper and educated now. We're just extremely honest. We need Martha making sure everything is, is met. And we need Mary to say, hey, we got to wait and let the Holy Spirit kiss us. Let the wind of the Holy Spirit get the junk out of our lives. If we have a convergence of those two things, you'll be leaving the campus every time you gather, and you'll be going out into the community, and you'll so transform people that they'll want to come with you and hang out with you at this piece of real estate. They'll want to experience the presence of God. We can't compromise the presence of God. One of the challenges we have, uh, you know, we have 14 undergraduate schools, one seminary. We have now probably half of them are now university statuses that we have a lot of our young people coming up and getting affected by another stream of Christianity, which is a little bit out of balance in the grace message. It's very easy grace. So they have such a, a so-called revelation on it that they're living sloppy. And they're saying, you know, a lot of things we've done for the last 100 years that made us the largest missions movement in the world and the fastest part of Christianity around the world, it's not that necessary, is it? And it's, it, it's, a, it's a problem. We need the reconciliation of Martha and Mary. And that takes... The love of Jesus, which brings us to the passion. Did not our hearts burn when he was with us? Yes. You remember the first time you really had an encounter with the living God? Dave, like David said, my sins were ever before me and then they were removed. Do you remember the times of your personal epiphanies? When the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob broke through a heart, he could have been defrauded by family, parents, husbands, whatever, corporations, 
And then God came and descended through the person of the Holy Spirit. And you were able to sleep that night. You were able to stand after doing all stand and no longer fight the battle because you knew the battle was the Lord's. And you knew, as Paul said in Romans 5, that the love of God is shed or brought on your heart by the Holy Spirit. So we have to have this convergence. The, the Martha church will, will default to social responsibilities, and, and it's important. It's important. We have a disaster ministry at the church. We have tractor trailers when there's a hurricane or a wildfire. Okay, we, we get that. But when people get into our buildings, we want them to get, come into the building or the airspace of every individual that sits in those seats a couple times a week when they're at Walmart or whatever the stores are up here. Because when they come into your airspace, they're going to sense something. The person waiting on you at the restaurant is going to experience something. And it's going to change your life. Then they'll come. They'll come to experience God. But they'll leave with a purpose. Because those who know their God shall be strong. And we'll do the doing. We'll, we'll do the Martha stuff. You know, the Martha stuff has to get done. But the Mary stuff. And don't compromise your MO of the presence of the Lord. And that's what I love about your pastor, your pastoral team, and everybody I've had a chance to meet. And I haven't had a chance to meet a lot of you new folks. You know, what draw you here is the, is the desire to seek the presence of the Lord. For where the presence of the Lord is, there's the fullness of everything that he has for you. And it's going, to, it's going to allow the prophetic to be purified by grace and the love of God. It's going to allow you to have a burden for people. Because the people out in the community, they're so disoriented. The conscience is seared so much. They've been defrauded. They've given a piece of their hearts to so many men, so many women, so many companies, so, so many different things. And they're defrauded. And the next man will never meet that need. The next woman will never meet that need. The next race will never meet that need. The, but when people come into the airspace of the true church, the person that serves, the person that experiences and releases the power of God, something happens. This one thing is necessary. Mary has chosen the good portion. Notice the word portion. There's plenty of portions to experience the gifts of God the windfall of the Holy Spirit, impartation of spiritual gifts, strongholds broken, and also, what is God's ministry for me? And say you know even now, even as you go into that building, hey, listen, visiting guy from Florida, I still know my gift, and I'm going to bring it over there. Good. But God's going to expect more of it in a different level, in a different dynamic. And so you're going to have to ask that question again. Will I fulfill God's purpose for my generation? Will I? What makes us accountable to keep the two women from shooting? So we know we need to be a purpose-driven people. We know we need to be a, a presence-driven people. And it comes down to passion. You got to have love that forgives. You cannot hold bitterness or malice. You cannot afford not to release God's grace on people that defrauded you. Defrauded the church corporately. It's easy to have a second, second party offense of people that this church has poured itself into, led them to Christ, married their kids, buried their parents, and then they want to go to happy church down the street. Um, you know, I'm preaching to myself. You know, I'm married to a prophet, so she holds me accountable. So I don't believe it. Led them to Christ, gave them past appreciation money, married their kids, dedicated their babies, buried their parents, and now they're going to, are you kidding me? And she'll say, get over it, big boy. They're not yours, they're God's. It's a great wife. Passion-driven church. 
As you leave the 10th chapter of the story of those two women, there's something interesting in Luke chapter 11, verse 9 through 13. Turn to it on your phone, over your handheld device. This thing's already froze on me. That's why I still bring the old school. I still bring a Bible. <laughs> this thing here. I still, I still do both, okay? Let me put this to rest. Luke 11, 9 through 13, I tell you, ask, and it'll be given to you. Seek, and you'll find. Knock, and it'll be opened to you. For everyone who asks, receives. And the one who seeks, finds. And the one who knocks, it'll be open. God wants to do something tonight. I believe he's going to do two things in regards to the gifts and the prophetic. He's going to stir up, and he's going to impart. But it's not going to be about that. It's going to be about you leaving here. Knowing that you will have a purpose. You're going to fulfill that purpose in your generation. One day you're going to hear, well done, good and faithful servant. And the pastor who eulogizes your funeral will not have to lie about it. Amen. And the other thing is, is that you're going to be a person known in the midst of all the camps of Christianity. And please do not trash other streams of Christianity. Every second Thursday, I'll have Episcopal priests, fighting fundamentalists, King James only pastors, uh, Baptists. I'll have Southern Baptists. I'll have Church of God, Anderson, Indiana, Church of God, Cleveland, Tennessee, Independent Charismatics. I, I come, and they come every second Thursday, and I love them and feed them. I believe in food evangelism. Okay, I'm Italian American, all right. I get to them through their stomach. Then we pray, we strategize for the city, and try to make it hard to go to hell from Deland, Florida. That's our joint <laughs> motto for the whole city. Are we still hungry in America in 2017? Are we enjoying some synthetic economic boom and everything's okay and none of our heads been cut off? And our kids are getting beaten up for being Christians. And how's our view of our, of our Heavenly Father? Is it distorted by earthly men? And the same portion of Scripture says in verse 11, what father among you? If his son asks for a fish, and instead give him a fish and give him a serpent. If he asks for an egg, will he give him a scorpion? If you then, who are evil, <laughs> know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to them? We'll ask another context, another gospel. It says give good things to those who ask. A passion-driven church gets healed from a bad relationship of a distorted view of the Father in heaven and through earthly fathers. And just maybe, just maybe this morning or this evening, the key that God is offering you before we're going to touch and change the spiritual transformation of the people that we're coming in contact in this area is that we have to reconcile in differences that our passion has been held back when people need it. And we don't think they need it because they ignored us or they hurt us. Because if we can't reconcile that in the church, that's the, that's the market out there. That's who we're trying to reach. They're broken. They're abused. We don't get it right in here. We could have all the presence of God here and just be presence junkies we can have all the purpose we want the letter of the law killeth but the spirit of the law gives life but this is a gospel of love and a gospel of love has to give it never demands God so loved that he gave that building will not be big enough if you walk out and you reckon in your heart to know your purpose, the purpose of God, and to fulfill it in your life, in your generation, not by your own strength, by the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit. And you hold each other accountable by practicing the love factor with each other. And you will see people like the, male, the minor prophet, Micah, I believe it was, they'll grab your jacket or your shirt and they'll say, take me to your God. We hear the cry of Joel, multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision, crying out. I believe God wants to do something now. Can we have the incredible worship team to come up and just start ministering? 
And could you stand with me? Regardless of what age category I mentioned earlier, will you fulfill God's purposes for your generation in your life? If you say yes, that's good. But will you do it with flesh, religion, or with the presence of the Holy Spirit? If you say yes to that, that's good. But it'll never go beyond the doors into a dying world if you don't exercise the love factor. This is just a practice session for all eternity. If we don't get the love thing right here, you know, we go from the 613 laws of the Torah to 10 commandments. And Jesus said, two commandments I give to you. Love the Lord God with all your heart, all your mind, all your soul, and to love your neighbor as yourself. Then he narrows it down to one. It's one commandment I give to you. Love one another as I have loved you. So before we ask God to impart spiritual gifts, and do whatever he wants to do, we got to go a little bit deeper in our heart. I want Pastor Glenn to come back in this church, man. It's just overflowing with freedom, clear conscience. A vessel, new vessels for new wine. Wouldn't that be great? So, Father, we thank you. And we ask by your love, not by your sword, by your love first and then the spirit of the law to fillet our heart and take out damaged tissue from abuse from a lack of forgiveness from bitterness from spiritual pride my way my righteousness spiritual laziness. It's somebody else's job. I'm retired now. I'm going to Florida. I don't have to do anything anymore. It's somebody else. It's the youth's turn. It's the millennials' turn. They, they need to look just like me. Go, God help us. No. And this is probably really a hard thing. I don't, I don't know if it is or not, but maybe it is. But I shared something with our own congregation this past Sunday. You know, in the first century church, they repented to each other all the time. And they were each other's brother keepers. By the third century, the church got organized in Rome and in the East the Mediterranean. They repented every week. After the Reformation, nobody repents to anybody anymore. And maybe, maybe that's a little out of balance. It's just between me and God. I, I get it. There's only one mediator between God and man. That's Jesus. I got, I got that. You got that. But with every head bowed, every eye closed, if, if there's an area of, of darkness in your life, of unforgiveness, the measure of what you think the presence of God is will just be a a thimble compared to what God really wants to pour into you. Can we deal with that now? If you just raise your hand towards God, say, God, I give you my rights, my expectations, my offense, my hurt, my unforgiveness. Can we do that right now? This is, let me tell you something, you're going to experience revival. Matter of fact, you know, I have snowbirds. I feel like being a summer bird and come up here and start living like six months out of the year because what I see now is, is transparency and God thanks you. See, 
had to tell this to my youngest son. He's a Marine Company commander. He survived multiple deployments in Afghanistan and, and uh, Iraq. And, and, I, and he said, pray for me, Dad. I might go into the FBI, and, but, I, but, but and pray for me. And I go, Sam, I want to tell you something. I said, if you regard iniquity in your heart, God will not hear your prayers. So mom and dad, yeah, we always pray for you. We pray. We, you've, we've been on our face for every deployment. But I had to say that to my son, one of my four children. Can I say it to you? We cannot, our physical immune system cannot afford to have any level of it in our life. Our marriages can't afford to have any of it. Our church family, it cannot be named once among us. Father, I thank you. You said by humility and the fear of the Lord come riches, honor, and life. In the name of Jesus, we thank you for repentance and grace. Now just quietly just give that thing to him. Give that broken promise. Give that hurt, that wound, the abuse. And just, the Lord, just give me a prophetic picture of addiction and familiar sins and addictions as you just give the underlining root cause of that to ease the pain give it to God and, and the surface manifestation will be broken in Jesus name <laughs>